Mr. Minister, my friend, uh, welcome back to Washington. Uh, it is always uh, a pleasure to meet Minister Shankar, whether it's uh, here in New York, in Delhi, Melbourne, Bali, or anywhere else. Um, and I think our own conversations, um, deep extended conversations that have taken place, in fact, over many years, because we were counterparts when I was last um, at the State Department as Deputy Secretary. I think it reflects the fact that um, the partnership between our countries, between India and the United States, is simply one of the most consequential in the world. It's vital to addressing virtually every uh, global challenge that our people face, whether it's health security, climate change, food security, upholding a free and open uh, international order, to name just a few. Uh, over the past years, we have made real progress in elevating that partnership uh, bilaterally, that is directly between us, through institutions like the Quad and the G20, uh, and in international organizations, including at the United Nations. Uh, today we talked about how we can further advance our shared security, uh, economic and, and geopolitical goals. Last week in New York, we were both witness to genuine unity among the vast majority of UN member states, developing and developed, big and small, north and south, on the need to work together to address these shared challenges that all of our people face, as well as to uphold the United Nations Charter and its core principles, including sovereignty, territorial integrity, and human rights. Um, we're grateful for the minister's partnership and leadership on these fronts. That includes in the Security Council, where, uh, as we were together, uh, he underscored the message that Prime Minister Modi delivered recently in Uzbekistan that, and I quote, today's era is not of war. And then in the General Assembly, where the Prime Minister said of India, and I quote, we are on the side that respects the UN Charter and its founding principles, end quote. So is the United States. We recognize that to meet the challenges we face, members of the UN must not only uphold the Charter, but also modernize the institution, including by making the Security Council more inclusive. Uh, that's why in his address to the General Assembly, President Biden expressed his support for increasing the number of both permanent and non-permanent representatives of the Security Council, a long-standing goal of India. This includes permanent seats for those nations we've long supported and uh, permanent seats for countries in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean. In his own General uh, Assembly address, uh, the minister uh, also highlighted the food, fuel, and fertilizer crises that have hit countries as they struggle to rebuild from the COVID pandemic. And indeed, if you look at how we spent most of our week last week at the United Nations, it was focusing on these very challenges. Um, we've been working to rally allies and partners, not only to help people uh, around the world most affected by these crises, but also to make sure that we are part of the solution to creating durable ways of dealing with these challenges. For example, on food security, not only responding to the emergency need, uh, but also helping uh, countries develop durable agricultural uh, productive capacity. Um, we know as well that each of these crises has been exacerbated by Russia's war in Ukraine, and it's why we continue to marshal international pressure on President Putin to end his war of choice. Uh, we also held a quad ministerial on the margins of the UN with uh, uh, the minister and I continuing to work with our Australian and Japanese counterparts to realize what is a shared vision uh, of a free, open Indo-Pacific that's connected, that's prosperous, that's secure, and that is resilient. Um, and here, it's worth emphasizing that we're bringing complementary strengths to bear on problems that none of us can address effectively alone. A few examples, cybercrime. You saw in the joint statement that we issued uh, in New York last week uh, our agreement to deny safe haven to ransomware operations emanating from within our respective countries uh, because a foothold anywhere can be used to stage attacks everywhere uh, and to assist one another in the face of cyber attacks against critical infrastructure. One of the clearest ways that Quad partners can continue to deliver for people across the region is by being there in times of their greatest need. Uh, in New York, we also took a step that will increase our capacity to do that. Uh, we signed a set of guidelines to deepen our coordination among the four countries on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, in today's meeting and uh, as well at dinner last night, 
We also talked about ways to further strengthen our strategic partnership and advance shared objectives. This includes helping one another prevent a climate catastrophe and adapt to the changes to come because the future of our people and people everywhere depends in no small part on hitting the ambitious targets that we both set. That includes India's goal of installing 500 gigawatts of non-fossil fuel capacity by 2030, which would mean more than 60 percent of India's electricity comes from non-polluting energy sources. We're helping to do that through the U.S.-India Climate and Clean Energy Agenda 2030 partnership, which is helping to foster joint research and development, mobilizing finance from the private sector and multilateral institutions, and finding ways to scale up innovative clean energy technologies. As the world's two biggest democracies, we're also committed to an enduring project, as our founders put it, of striving to form a more perfect union. This is a project for both of us. Uh, we have to work together to show that our democracies can meet our people's needs, and we must continue to hold ourselves, both of us, as well as our fellow democracies, to our core values, including respect for universal human rights, like freedom of religion and belief and freedom of expression, which makes our democracies stronger. Uh, we explored ways to keep building our dynamic economic partnership. Uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which we launched in May, is one way we'll do this. Just a few weeks ago, India affirmed its intention to participate in three of the framework's pillars on supply chains, clean economy, and fair economy. Uh, the U.S. is India's largest trading partner, with $157 billion last year in bilateral trade. We're India's largest source of foreign direct investment, with a diverse range of U.S. companies investing $45 billion in India, Google, Microsoft, Whirlpool, Boeing, GE, and I could go on. But we see more room to grow and to do it in a way that creates jobs for workers in both of our countries. Uh, the U.S.-India Commercial Dialogue, the U.S.-India CEO Forum will give us more opportunities to do that in the months ahead. So these are just some of the ways, multilaterally, regionally, bilaterally, that we're bringing this close relationship between India and the United States even closer together. And with India holding the presidency of the Security Council in December and taking over the presidency of the G20 next year, we'll be able to drive more concerted global cooperation and action together. Um, at an event this weekend, uh, you called, Mr. Minister, the shift in U.S.-India relations the single biggest change that you've observed in decades of service as a diplomat. Uh, the minister said, and I quote, it did not change only because of government policies. The relationship changed because of Indian Americans. And I could not agree more. We're grateful to have an Indian American community that does so much to deepen ties between our countries, as well as to shape the fabric of this country. Uh, and I'd add that we're also grateful to communities in India, including of American origin, that are doing their part to strengthen the relationship for the good of both of our countries and both of our peoples. So with that, John, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, really a great pleasure to join Secretary Blinken uh, at this media event uh, at the conclusion of what I can honestly say is a very productive morning of discussions. Uh, I was last here in April, uh, and obviously a lot of things in the world have changed since then. Uh, while we have spent uh, uh, quite some time this morning, uh, I thank the Secretary and his wife for hosting us yesterday at a working dinner. Uh, this was really a very gracious gesture, and I think uh, an occasion that both of us put to good use. Obviously, a large part of our deliberations uh, today were devoted to the strengthening of our bilateral relationship. Uh, most of you would readily understand that it has grown very significantly uh, in its scope and depth over the last few years. We engage each other uh, across pretty much every domain. And the quality of our cooperation, as indeed of our conversations, have steadily improved. In today's meeting, uh, we discussed our political coordination, working together in plurilateral and multilateral formats, and exchanging assessments and, uh, uh, on uh, collaborating on important uh, regional issues and global challenges. I would specifically mention the Ukraine conflict and the Indo-Pacific situation in that regard. I, share with, uh, I shared with uh, Secretary Blinken my experience of interactions during the UN General Assembly, 
about the deep anxieties in the global south on fuel, on food, on fertilizers, uh, the increasing salience of green growth, digital development, and affordable health is today very, very evident. We must not let current developments jeopardize Agenda 2030 on SDGs or to deflect us from climate action and climate justice commitments. Our cooperation in different bilateral domains is progressing vigorously. Uh, naturally, Secretary Blinken and I did a comprehensive talk taking, but separately, I met uh, Defense Secretary Austin and Commerce Secretary Raimondo to review their particular areas. Uh, I participated in a particularly interesting uh, roundtable uh, organized by the National Science Foundation. Uh, I will be meeting business leaders over the next two days, and given the bipartisan support that we have long enjoyed in the U.S. Congress, I look forward to interacting with some of its prominent members. There will also be an occasion for me to engage think tanks and policy analysts so that there is a better understanding of India's concerns and interests. Having said that, uh, there are particular issues in the current global context that shape the evolution of our cooperation and therefore merit your attention as well. Prominent among them is our commitment to address the global volatility which has arisen from the COVID, from conflicts, and from climate events. India and the US have a strong interest in encouraging more resilient and reliable supply chains. This requires policy decisions, as well as practical measures involving the business community. We are focused on those goals. Furthermore, the digital world mandates a greater emphasis on trust and transparency. This, too, has been the subject of detailed conversations and follow-up action. When it comes to critical and emerging technologies, we both see the value of expanding trusted research. Our national security, our economic security, our technology security are all enhanced by closer collaboration. It is also in our mutual interest to facilitate the development and mobility of talent. We agreed that impediments in this regard should be addressed. There is a keen interest in India's national education policy, and we will explore how that can best serve to expand our partnership. On mobility, specifically visas, uh, this is particularly crucial given its centrality to education, business, technology, and family reunions. There have been some challenges of late uh, and uh, I flag it to Secretary Blinken and his team, and I have every confidence that they will look at some of these problems seriously and positively. All these issues and more were evaluated not just in our bilateral context, but also from the perspective of the Quad and the I2U2. We are keen to move forward on the Indo-Pacific economic framework. I saw some creative thinking on how to repurpose Establish mechanisms for more contemporary collaboration. Our two countries are, contributed, are committed to contributing to the betterment of the global commons. True to our traditions, we rise above narrow national interest to serve the needs of the larger international community. We do so on the basis of our belief in a rules-based order, in our respect for international law, and in our adherence to the UN Charter. India-U.S. cooperation is today visible across the length and breadth of the Indo-Pacific, and perhaps even beyond. It has many facets and expresses itself in different ways. We particularly value closer coordination in the Indian subcontinent, where we perceive that our convergences are very strong. It is essential that democracy, pluralism, progress, development, and prosperity are nurtured. Conversely, we must counter radicalization, extremism, and fundamentalism. India is widening its international footprint, and there are many more regions where we will be intersecting with American interests. It is to our mutual benefit that this be a complementary process. Coming out of the UNGA, the UNGA, the reform of the UN is a particularly topical subject. We appreciate the positive approach of the US to this issue reflected in the position articulated by President Biden himself. We look forward to working with the U.S. to take this further. 
I also expressed appreciation at the strong cooperation that we have got from the U.S. on the question of tackling international terrorism. I, in particular, I refer to the listing of well-known and wanted terrorists by the U.N. sanction process. In many other formats, too, our two countries collaborate to keep the world safer and more secure. We spoke over the last two days of our commitment to practicing and furthering democracy, human rights, and good governance. Each country approaches this set of issues from their history, tradition, and societal context. Our yardstick for judgment are the integrity of the democratic processes, the respect and credibility that they command with the people, and the non-discriminatory delivery of public goods and services. India does not believe that the efficacy or indeed the quality of democracy should be decided by vote banks. This is an area where we look forward to a healthy exchange of views. There will be convergences and best practices that we can both profit by and perhaps even share with third countries. India will be taking over the presidency of the G20 at the end of this year. I appreciate the expression of support by Secretary Blinken towards making our chairship successful. Once again, I thank the Secretary for his warm welcome, for the open and comfortable conversations we have had, and for his commitment to further what we both believe is the critical relationship of our era. Thank you. We'll now turn to questions. We'll start with Ian Marlowe of Bloomberg. Thank you. Uh, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, we've seen several reported uh, leaks in the Nord Stream pipeline system uh, that Germany has said could be an act of sabotage. What's the U.S. assessment of what we're seeing there, particularly given Russian, previous Russian moves to curtail gas supplies? And can you speak a little bit more broadly to the pressure that Europe is coming, on, co coming under as winter and a potential energy crisis looms? Uh, and uh, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar, thank you for taking our questions. First, I'm wondering if you could offer India's perspective on U.S. efforts to implement a global price cap on Russian energy. Would India consider joining that kind of price cap mechanism? And do you see it as potentially a way for India, as well as, well as other countries in the global south, uh, to get more leverage and negotiate even cheaper prices for fuel? Uh, and just a second question, if I may. Uh, can you talk a little bit about India's plans going forward uh, for military hardware and equipment, given the sanctions that the US and others are putting on uh, Russian industry and given India's historic reliance on Russian technology. Uh, how is India trying to head off challenges related to Russia being potentially unable to service that equipment going forward as a result of sanctions? Can Russia still fulfill all of India's requirements? And will India look at perhaps more purchases of, say, American or Israeli military equipment? Thank you. Ian, thanks very much. Um, on the question on energy security and Nord Stream in particular, uh, a few things. Uh, the leaks are under investigation. Um, there are initial reports indicating that uh, this may be the result of an attack or some kind of sabotage, but these are initial reports and we haven't confirmed that yet. But if it is confirmed, that's clearly in, in no one's interest. Um, now, my understanding is the leaks will not have a significant impact on Europe's energy resilience. Um, and What's critical is that we are working day in, day out, both on a short-term basis and a long-term basis, to address uh, energy security for, uh, for Europe and, uh, and, for that matter, around the world. Uh, short-term, just to cite a few examples, we are working on implementing the uh, oil price cap to keep Russian oil flowing, but uh, at a steep discount. Uh, that, uh, of course, will deny Russia excess revenues that uh, it would use to prosecute its aggression against uh, Ukraine, uh, and at the same time, as I said, keep oil flowing on world markets. Uh, we're working to continue to surge LNG supplies to Europe in cooperation with global partners, uh, including uh, in the Indo-Pacific. It's worth noting that our own uh, oil production is up by more than 500,000 barrels per day this year. Our LNG exports are up uh, more than 20 percent since last year. In fact, we became the largest LNG supplier uh, to the European Union and the UK this year. Uh, and we've become the uh, largest uh, overall LNG exporter this year. Um, 
And of course, as you know, we've been tapping into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at unprecedented levels. Others are doing the same. This is having an impact both on supply and on price. Long term, um, we're supporting efforts to reduce uh, reliance on fossil fuels, including LNG over the long term, including through a task force that we established with the European Union uh, some months ago on energy security that's working very actively looking at ways both to uh, reduce demand, uh, to pursue renewables, to make the transition. Uh, and then we're working with global partners to reduce dependence uh, on fossil fuels and accelerate the transition to renewables beyond Europe. It's a long way of saying that there are clear challenges in the, um, in the months ahead that we're addressing, but there is also a very significant opportunity to do two things. One, to finally end the dependence uh, of Europe on Russian energy, and thus um, the position that uh, Europe is in of being on the receiving end of the weaponization of energy uh, by Russia, and also to accelerate the, the transition to, uh, to renewables and to make sure that we're addressing the climate challenge that we face. So we can uh, and we are working to do all of this in a way that provides energy security for Europeans and uh, not only gets, gets us through the next months, but leaves us in a better, stronger position for the years ahead. Um, on the price cap, uh, we had a brief discussion on it uh, this morning. Uh, more technical people are engaged between the two systems on this particular subject. Uh, it is, of course, a G7 uh, initiative. Uh, now, you have to understand uh, that uh, in the last few months, uh, the energy markets are already under very great stress. Uh, countries in the global south uh, have found it difficult to compete for uh, limited energy, uh, not just in terms of pricing, escalating pricing, but often uh, in terms of availability. Uh, there are tenders, countries have had tenders for which they don't even get a reply from, uh, from suppliers. So our concern right now is that energy markets already under stress must soften up. Uh, we would uh, judge any situation, frankly, by how it affects us and other countries of the global south, because as I communicated to the secretary, there is a very, very deep concern uh, in among developing countries uh, about uh, how their energy security needs are addressed or not. Uh, on the military equipment, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I, do, I don't think uh, in recent months we have faced any particular problems in terms of uh, servicing uh, uh, and uh, spare parts supply of equipment that we have uh, got in the past from Russia. Uh, you know, whether we, uh, where we get our military equipment and platforms from, that's not an issue, honestly, which is a new issue or an issue which has particularly changed uh, uh, because of uh, geopolitical tensions. I think we look at uh, possibilities across the world. Uh, we look at the quality of technology, the quality of capability, the terms on which uh, that particular equipment is offered, and we exercise a choice which we believe is in our national interest. Now. Uh, in, in, if, you, if you were to look at the last 15 years, for example, you can see uh, that uh, we have actually uh, procured a lot from the United States. Uh, uh, if you were to consider, for example, aircraft, the C-17, the C-130, the P-8, or the Apache helicopter, or the Chinooks, or, uh, or the howitzers, the M777 howitzers. We have done so from France. I mean, we bought recently the Rafale aircraft. We have done so from Israel. So we have a tradition of multi-sourcing. Uh, and, uh, you know, for us, uh, how to get the optimal uh, deal from a competitive situation uh, is really uh, what, what uh, uh, this is all about. We'll next turn to Lalit Jha, Trust of India. Thanks, Ned. Uh, thanks, Mr. Minister. Uh, you have been associated with this India relationship for decades and dealt with. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
you have been dealing with this India issue for decades and dealt multiple leadership, multiple administrations. Uh, what is your overall sense of the trajectory of the relationship? And Mr. Secretary, I would like to pick up a few points from your opening remarks. Uh, first, you said they, uh, we, you discussed uh, to strengthen a strategic partnership, and this includes helping each other. Mm -hmm. The recent decision of the US uh, to provide 450 million FM sales or F-16 uh, maintenance uh, package certainly is not, uh, doesn't help India's strategic national interest. Everyone knows uh, where F-16 has been used in the past and where it will be used. Certainly is not being used uh, for counterterrorism operation, if you can help us understand that. Uh, on uh, on uh, India's role in Ukraine, can you give us a sense what India role, India's can play a role in Ukraine peace process, uh, given that Prime Minister Modi's recent remarks to President Putin and Mexico's proposal of a three-member committee, including Prime Minister Modi, uh, His Holiness Pope, and UN Secretary General to help resolve uh, uh, peace, uh, bring peace in Ukraine. And finally, on your comments on Indian Americans, uh, you know Indian Americans have played a big role in this relationship, and they are a big supporters of Democratic Party. But there's frustration brewing up among this community as well because of the 700 days of visa waiting period among Indian Americans when they ask their friends and families and parents to come from India. All the embassies and consulates are giving them next first appointment they are getting of 2024. Thank you, sir. Those were six questions bundled in one. It's very impressive. It's so very impressive. I think you, 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 I think you topped our, our colleague, uh, Ian. And so. uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, look, uh, uh, I think the secretary was good enough to refer to something I said on the weekend uh, to a group of Indian Americans and Indians who live here, uh, which is that the big change that I have seen in my four decades as a diplomat uh, was actually in the transformation of India-U.S. relations. And your question, uh, uh, you know, how do I see the trajectory? Uh, quite honestly, I see uh, today a United States uh, very international, uh, very much more to engaging, uh, very much more open uh, to engaging a country like India, uh, which is actually thinking beyond traditional alliances, uh, which, uh, uh, which has uh, been very effective at uh, finding common ground with potential or actual partners, uh, and uh, uh, a very good example of all this is actually in the Quad. Uh, I mean, uh, the fact was a quad was something we tried uh, about two decades, 15 years ago. It didn't work, uh, and it is working very well today. And it's doing, uh, uh, you know, it's it's grown remarkably uh, in in the course of the last uh, two years. So I I think uh, uh, for us uh, uh, today the, the relationship with the U.S. opens up a whole range of possibilities. Possibilities not just with the United States, though those are important in themselves, because I think at this point of time, uh, you know, there's so much that uh, India, and I assume the U.S. too, stands to benefit from working uh, with the United States, uh, uh, for, you know, whether it's economy, with its technology, with its security. Uh, the, but the other part is also, I, I would say, uh, it's been uh, for us, uh, a very uh, positive experience, a very encouraging one with a lot of promise of working with the U.S. to shape the direction of the world. I mean, to me, that's really the big jump uh, which we have made. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think the more we work together, the more we engage each other, I think many more possibilities will come. So very frankly, uh, that's a long way of saying that I'm very bullish about the relationship. I can, I can only echo, first of all, what uh, Mr. Jayashankar said. Uh, I think uh, no uh, two countries have a greater ability and, I think, uh, opportunity and responsibility to try to shape the future of the century than the United States and <laughs> India as the, uh, the world's two largest democracies. And what is very gratifying to me is the fact that um, 
in all of these meetings, in all of these conversations, in this ongoing dialogue we have, uh, we are thinking together and working together uh, in ways that, uh, that we haven't before. That doesn't mean that we don't have differences. Uh, we do, um, and we will. But it also means that because of the um, depth and quality of the dialogue we have, we, we, we talk about everything and uh, work closely together on how we can advance um, the agenda that we have in common, which, as you've heard, I think, from both of us, extends to virtually every issue that uh, is confronting uh, our own citizens and people around the world. On the specific uh, questions you raised, um, on the F-16s, uh, to be very clear, and it's important, um, this is a sustainment program for F-16s that Pakistan uh, has, has long had. These are not new planes, new systems, new weapons. It's sustaining what they have. We have a responsibility and an obligation to whomever we uh, provide uh, military equipment to make sure uh, that uh, it's maintained and sustained. Uh, that's our obligation. Um, Pakistan's program bolsters its capability to deal with terrorist threats emanating from Pakistan or from the region. It's in no one's interest that those threats be able to go forward with impunity. Uh, and so this, uh, this capability that Pakistan has had can benefit uh, all of us in dealing with terrorism. On the question of visas, I'm extremely sensitive uh, to this. Um, if it's any consolation, I can tell you that this is a challenge that we're facing around the world, and it's a product uh, largely of the COVID pandemic. Um, our ability to issue visas uh, dropped dramatically during COVID, and without boring you with all of the details, this is the um, one uh, self-financing asset of part of the, uh, of the State Department. That is, around the world, the fees that we get uh, for um, issuing visas are, um, go to our budget and they go to our capacity to um, put in place the people needed to process the visas. When COVID hit, the demand for visas fell through the floor. Uh, visa fees uh, went away. Um, the system as a whole suffered. And then, of course, in actually issuing visas, even with much more limited resources, we had constraints from COVID about the number of people we could have in uh, our embassies at any one time, et cetera. We are now building back very uh, determinately from, from that, surging resources. We have a plan when it comes to India to address the backlog of, of visas that's built up. I think you'll see that play out in the coming months, but it's something that we're very focused on. These connections, these people-to-people -people ties, whether it's students, whether it's um, uh, business people, uh, whether it's uh, tourists, whether it's family. This is what really links us together, and the last thing we want to do is make that any more difficult. On the contrary, we want to facilitate it. So bear with us. Uh, this will play out over the next few months, but we're very focused on it. Finally, India's role um, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, a potential peace process. I really want to emphasize what Prime Minister Modi said, because I think he captured um, as well as anyone I've heard, uh, fundamentally what, um, what this moment is about. As he said, this is not an era, this is not a time for war. We could not agree more. We saw the aggression, the threat of the aggression mounting from Russia against Ukraine last year. We warned the world about it, and we tried everything possible to avert it through diplomacy. Unfortunately, Tragically, President Putin pursued his aggression nonetheless. And now the Ukrainian people, but also the world, are reaping the consequences. We see this not only in the suffering of the Ukrainian people, the decimation of their country uh, by uh, Russian forces, uh, but we see it also in the profound threat to the United Nations Charter that binds us together, the basic principles that are so necessary to keep peace and security around the world that came to being after two world wars. Sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence, um, they are being challenged. And we're seeing the consequences in everything from rising food insecurity to the energy prices that we've talked about. So it's profoundly in everyone's interest for Russia to stop its aggression. But it really is incumbent upon Russia and President Putin to decide that this is what it's going to do. One person has the ability to stop this aggression tomorrow, and that's Vladimir Putin. 
And as I said last week, if Russia stops fighting, the war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends, because Russia has seized territory um, through this aggression that uh, you know, makes it ch challenging uh, for uh, Ukraine to um, sustain its, uh, its viability. Uh, so this is incumbent upon President, uh, President Putin. We are very determined that if there is any opportunity for meaningful diplomacy to try to end the war, uh, we will be part of it. But as of this date, speaking to you today, we continue to see no signs from Russia and President Putin that they're prepared to engage in meaningful diplomacy uh, in a negotiation that would lead to a just resolution uh, of the aggression. It is on uh, Russia, it is on President Putin, uh, and uh, we will see if they finally respond. I think it's very important, though, that voices as consequential as India's make themselves heard, and that's why I thought that the Prime Minister's comments uh, were so significant. Uh, in the war in Ukraine to end. And then to follow up on your response to my colleague on conversations about a price cap oil, um, you said that was briefly discussed during your meeting with the Secretary today, but it seems that you still have concerns and right now India is not in favor of a cap on Russian oil. So is that accurate and what would change that position? Um, and Secretary Blinken, one question on Iran and one question on Ukraine. Um, with the new Treasury General licenses last week, there are still technical hurdles when it comes to getting internet to Iranians. So I'm wondering what more the United States could do and if the United States would work with private companies if they were to try and physically get hardware into Iran to make sure that they could facilitate the distribution of internet to the country. And then the second question on Russia, what cost will the United States impose on Russia if it annexes these Ukrainian territories that are holding these so-called referendums? And will the U.S. still allow Ukrainian troops to use U.S. weaponry to defend against Russians in those territories no matter what the outcome of these referendums and this, these possible annexations. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, we have taken the position uh, privately, publicly, confidentially, consistently uh, uh, from February 24th that this conflict uh, is not in anybody's interest. And we've always advocated that the best way forward is to return to dialogue and diplomacy. Now, your question, are we actively working on something? Uh, uh, in the past, uh, wherever we have been able to contribute uh, something, we have been open to it. And I, I remain in very active touch with a lot of my colleagues, colleagues in the G20, you know, colleagues in the UN Security Council, uh, some beyond. So uh, just as an example, uh, during the grain uh, shipment uh, uh, discussions in the Black Sea, uh, at that time uh, we had been approached uh, to also weigh in with Russia at a particularly delicate moment uh, of those discussions, which we did. Uh, right now, uh, there are um, some issues. Uh, I had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Ukraine uh, he did mention some very specific concerns which he thought merited our attention. Uh, where we, he thought we could be of some uh, use. Uh, the, uh, I had, uh, on a different set of issues, a discussion uh, with the UN Secretary General. Uh, he's been very active, as you know, on a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of specific concerns pertaining to the conflict, so it's not 
necessarily the overarching peace uh, prospect, but even in the current scenario, are there, uh, are there issues which we can solve or uh, in some way mitigate or ameliorate? So uh, there was some discussion with the UN Secretary General as well. I don't think it would be right for me to kind of go into specifics at this time. Uh, on, you know, do we have concerns, uh, this is in respect to your oil question. Look, we have concerns about the price of oil. I mean, we are a $2,000 per capita economy. I mean, the price of oil is breaking our back. I mean, that is our big concern. Um, Kylie, first on, on Iran. First things first. Um, Masa should be alive today. Uh, the only reason she's not is because a brutal regime took her life and took her life uh, because of uh, decisions she should be making about what she uh, would wear or not wear. Um, women in Iran have the right to wear what they want. They have the right to be free from violence. They have the right to be free from harassment. That's true in Iran. It's true, should be true everywhere. So for starters, uh, Iran needs to end its use of violence against women for exercising what should be a fundamental freedom. Uh, and as a general proposition, and in this specific instance, we stand with all of those who are exercising the universal right to peaceful protest. Um, as you noted, we've also taken action. Uh, and two things I would point to. We designated the so-called morality police and specific individuals for human rights abuses. Uh, and that imposes sanctions on them, and it would impose as well um, sanctions on anyone who seeks to do, in any way, do business with them. And then, uh, more specifically to the point you, you raised, we announced um, a general license uh, to facilitate the free flow of information inside Iran. So, for example, what this does is it authorizes companies to provide things like cloud services, uh, privacy technology, security technology, hardware and software uh, to enable the Iranians to better communicate among themselves and also with the rest of the world. Um, individual companies can come to us, to, to OFAC in this case, to uh, determine whether their technology fits under the, uh, under the license. And we will certainly look uh, for ways to uh, facilitate um, technology um, services being made accessible to people um, in Iran. On the question of Russia and uh, the uh, sham referenda and, and annexations that uh, seem to be proceeding in, in Ukraine, uh, one, we've been very clear that we are prepared and we will impose additional uh, severe and swift costs on Russia for proceeding with the, uh, the annexations. And again, it's uh, important to remember what's going on here. Russia invaded Ukraine, seized territory, and is engaged in a diabolical scheme on some of the territory it seized, where it has moved the local populace out, often through these filtration centers, uh, where people may be deported to, uh, uh, to Russia, elsewhere in Ukraine, or they simply disappear. Then they bus Russians in, they install puppet governments, um, and then they engage in the, uh, in the, in the referendum uh, and manipulate in any event the outcome to then claim that the territory um, belongs to Russia through, through annexation. We and many other countries have already been crystal clear. We will not, indeed we will never, recognize the annexation of Ukrainian territory uh, by Russia. Uh, and I've also been equally clear that Ukraine has the absolute right to defend itself throughout its territory, uh, including to take back the territory that has been illegally seized one way or another uh, by Russia. And the equipment, the weapons that we and many other countries uh, are providing them uh, have been used very effectively to do just that, as we've seen in Northeast uh, Ukraine and as we see as well uh, in the South. And um, be again, because there is no change 
at all in the uh, territory that is being uh, annexed by the by the Russians as a um, matter for for us or for uh, the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians will continue to do what they need to do to get back the land that has been taken from them. We will continue to support them in that effort. We'll take a final question from Rina Bar from for Rina Bardwaj. I'm I'm sorry I'm sorry Nazira we don't have time. Uh, from Rina Bardwaj, Asian News International. Uh, Minister Jay Shankar and Secretary Blinken, thank you for doing this. Um, Minister Jay Shankar, you've had a very busy week at ANGA, uh, meeting all your counterparts. Uh, now, uh, did they express their worries about uh, Ukraine, which you mentioned in your remarks, of course, but also Taiwan? And uh, did you discuss the impact of these developments on the global economy with Secretary Blinken? Uh, how, are the, how are the two countries going to work together to address these concerns? And my second question to Secretary Blinken is, um, you, you talked about F-16 and the obligation that the US mm. has, uh, but can you further clarify what counter -terror, uh, terror threats does Pakistan face and why is there a need for these, um, uh, these fighter jets? Mm. Also, there's a discussion with your uh, Pakistani counterpart to improve ties with India and to make the region more stable. What was their response? You did give them an advice to maintain peace. Uh, what, 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 is, what was the advice that you gave them? Mm. Um, you know, uh, I had, of course, a lot of meetings uh, in the UN in that week. I met, I guess, roughly about half the delegations uh, who were there. Uh, and uh, a common concern among them was the anxiety about, uh, about uh, global economic volatility and anxiety about you know, sharply increased energy prices, uh, of food inflation and food availability, uh, of uh, fertilizers which will impact food next year, of disrupted trade, uh, of shipping, of insurance, of airline movements, of travel. So uh, this was uh, honestly uh, not a, uh, an optimistic uh, global mood. Uh, which uh, you got from your colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, in particular, uh, the, you know, what the impact, the consequences of the Ukraine conflict has been uh, on many of these issues we, uh, I spoke about. And also, I think the, uh, the prospect of instability or, uh, uh, you know, or, or on, on in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, because uh, today Asia uh, and Indo-Pacific is so central to to global trade, uh, and in particularly in some very critical areas, so these were very very widely uh, prevalent uh, concerns. Uh, we had a good discussion about it yesterday evening, uh, and uh, uh, we do think uh, today. I mean, I speak for India, but I also speak to some degree for the relationship. Uh, having an impact on the world. We think the right thing today is to find ways of stabilizing the global economy, of, uh, of softening prices, of uh, making sure that uh, global trade and is more predictable, uh, that the sources of anxieties and tensions are less. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's really, you know, uh, Prime Minister Modi, of course, said this is not an era of war. But this is an era of where we seek development, where we seek prosperity, where we seek progress. Uh, and, and I think uh, India nationally and India through its key partners would like to do more to, to strengthen those trends. Um, on the question of the, uh, the F-16s again, uh, and it's important to be very clear, this is, as I said, about sustaining an existing program not adding a new one, and we have a responsibility to do that wherever we're engaged in the uh, provision of uh, defense equipment like F-16s. And second, as to what these are for, um, there are clear terrorism threats that continue to emanate uh, from Pakistan itself, as well as from neighboring countries, and whether it is uh, TTP that may uh, be targeting Pakistan, whether it's ISIS Khorasan, whether it's uh, Al-Qaeda, I think the threats are clear well-known, and we all have an interest in making sure uh, that um, we have the means to, uh, to deal with them. 
uh, and that's uh, what, uh, what this is about. Um, more broadly, we always encourage our friends to resolve their, uh, their differences through diplomacy, through dialogue. That hasn't changed. It won't change. It would not be appropriate for me to characterize Pakistan's response, just as I wouldn't characterize uh, our friend's response in, in a similar conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you. Thank you.